Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them to Luke chapter 19. We're going to go to Luke 19 and 20 today. We've got some scripture for you. I mean, we always have scripture, but it's a lot of scripture today is my point. Luke 19 and 20. We started the Passion Week last Sunday. We started talking about the triumphal entry, how Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He was the Prince of Peace bringing peace to the city of peace peacefully. He didn't come in on a horse. He didn't come with a sword. He came on a donkey saying, this is my city. As a conquering uh, uh, king, he came in and And the thing was, he was rejected as king. And because he was rejected, there was no peace. And that's what we're going to find out today, is Jesus' response once he realizes that the city of Jerusalem will be destroyed because they did not accept their king. So as we start with the Passion Week, though, I want you to real quick understand um, some of the things that take place during this week. Okay, so we have Palm Sunday, which we started with last week. Um, So Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. Then the next, on Monday, which is what we're going to talk about today, is that Jesus cleanses the temple. This is what we're going to talk about, the Monday happenings. Then Jesus teaches uh, on the Temple Mount on Tuesday, and then Judas betrays on Wednesday. He's the one, that's the day he most likely got the the funds to to betray Jesus. Jesus, uh, we call it Maundy Thursday, that's what the Methodist call it at least um uh the high tiding the 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 high level churches call it maundy thursday which is the night of the last supper and then uh good friday is the day in which he was on the cross holy saturday is the day in which the disciples sat in hiding and uh jesus was in the tomb and then sunday morning praise god for sunday morning resurrection sunday he was raised uh and now we know now we have hope Now we can live in heaven because of Resurrection Sunday. That would be. Now, the reason I'm telling you, why are you telling me this at the end of December? Because this week is what we're going to talk about for the next 13 weeks. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a very short amount of time over a long amount of time. I I just want to keep you uh, uh, understanding what we're talking about. So today we're going to talk about the day after Palm Sunday which was uh, the day uh, that he goes and cleanses the temple. I, I wanted to share this one quote. I just thought this was fascinating. We were talking about Palm Sunday last week, and then I'll get off that and leave it, okay? But um, t- Mother Teresa one time was being interviewed by Johnny Carson, and he asked her, if you ever won the Nobel Pre- Peace Prize, how would you deal with the accolades that come from that? Mother Ther- he was asking Mother Teresa, and Mother Teresa answered in her, her very humble way. She said, do you think, Mr. Carson, for one moment that the little donkey thought the crowd was giving him the praise and glory instead of Jesus? Now that's good. Can I just tell you something? I want every single one of you to be successful. I want your influence in this world. I want your bank accounts as fat as they can be. I want your influence to continue to increase. I want you to have more children than you wanted to have. I hope you have to build onto your house to keep the little uh, uh, brats. Just, I, I hope you get more than you ever wanted in this world. But I also pray daily that for a second, if you thought that it had anything to do with you, that he'd take everything away. The blessings of God are about his generosity and they're not about your worthiness. I pray to God that he would increase this church. I would love for us to be able to boast 160 folks live in this town and this church runs over 1,000 every Sunday. I would love to boast that. But if ever that boasting would be somehow put on our own selves, I ask the Lord never to do it. This, we're just the donkey bringing the king. We're just the donkey bringing in the king. When you go and evangelize, you don't have to worry about how good you are. You've got a great king. You're telling good news about something you've got nothing to do with. Jesus gave you good news, and it doesn't matter how good you are at it. Take the good news. Carry Jesus in your life. Verse 41, chapter 19, verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jesus wept. 
He wanted to bring peace to the city of peace, but when it did not receive him, he wept. I want you to hear the humanity. We love that Jesus wept when his friend Lazarus died, but I want you to understand, here comes Jesus walking into Jerusalem, and he looks at that city. What a beautiful scene it is. If you ever get the opportunity, I hope you take it. But when you're walking down uh, the Mount of Olives, you can look down into the city of Jerusalem, and then when you get to the bottom, you're looking up to the city of Jerusalem. And as he was on his way, he looks into the city, and his heart is crushed. He looks and he says, oh, Jerusalem. Oh, what I would have done. Oh, what I would have done to bring you peace. What I would have done to protect you. I believe in this moment, Jesus saw the destruction that was coming in AD 70. When not a single stone of the temple would be left on one another. They would wipe out the entire city. Over a half a million people were wiped out during the siege of AD 70. He said, would that you, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you, surround you, hem you in on every side, tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Believer, Recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus is here, and he wants to bring you peace. Now, let me just tell you, Fox News runs out of business if there's peace. CNN, they don't exist anymore if there's peace. In fact, if there's worldwide peace, there isn't a whole lot of use for government, is it? I'm not trying to freak anybody out or anything. I'm just telling you, a lot of the industries we pay attention to, the, the, core, the, the core foundation to them is fear and panic. If we live full of peace because our foundation is on Christ, the Prince of Peace, then we're not going to play all the games they want us to play. We're not going to freak out and do all the things they want us to do, which will make us their enemy. And that's why throughout history, the people of love, the people of joy, the people of peace, the Christians have been slaughtered by every great empire in history because they cannot stand, not a group of people who are based on love, they cannot stand a group of people they can't control. And let me just tell you, the easiest way to control somebody is with fear. The easiest, the simplest, the most childish way. And if you don't believe me, I just want you to know I grew up in a church where I didn't hear nearly as much about the love and peace of God. Now, I know they loved me, and I know God loved me, but I'm telling you, I heard a lot more about hell than the beauty of heaven. That is not to bring any shade on anybody else. Please don't get offended or anything like that. I'm just telling you right now. People say, I have people come to me on the regular. They say, Pastor, I just miss people preaching on hell. Let me just tell you, if you don't love Jesus once you get a glimpse of him, I would hate to see what it would produce in you if the only reason you came to this church is because you were afraid of hell. Jesus is so much more beautiful than hell is ugly. God is so much more generous than the devil is bad. I'm going to tell you, the devil is even, even as bad at being bad as Jesus is as good at being good. A lot of times we spend our time, we want to freak people out. We want to, we say, well, we need to tell somebody the truth. I'm just going to tell you right now. If somebody wants to be bent the wrong direction, you can sober them up with some fear for a week. But they're always going to chase after the things their appetites are bent toward. And until your satisfaction is found in the beauty of Jesus Christ, Until your satisfaction is based in the beauty of Jesus Christ, I don't even know that you're saved. But beyond that, I just don't want to use fear to get you on the hook. That's not the way I'm going to bait the hook anymore. I'm going to behold Jesus and I'm going to ask you to do the same. He is beautiful. He is good. He is peace. and He is all we need. Jesus wants you to have peace. He wants it for you. He wants it more than you want it. 
But this world uses fear. It is a great currency. I'm going to move on because i got a lot of scripture to go through. Here we go, verse 45. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold. Saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. I just want you, I know you've heard this, we've heard that said all the time, but I just want to give you a picture of what this means. A den of robbers. You have made it a den of robbers. Can I just tell you that, that thieves know where to go after they thieve. When, when they've done the bad things, they know where to corral back together and talk about and separate and, and all that. They know where to, to gang back up. And what Jesus is saying here is that the Temple Mount, which was set aside for beauty, for salvation, for, for this holy uh, relationship with God, what had been set aside for holiness has now been the place where the thieves, the robbers, the murderers actually get together, and that's their safe place. Now, if you're in the house today and you have not put your trust in Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. I am so glad you're here, and I hope today is your day of salvation. And if not today, I hope you'll come back. But I also hope at some point that this house of prayer, the convicting spirit of God, at some point that your soul, though contaminated by your sin and addictions, will not be able to stay in the presence of God any longer. That in order for you to be here, you have to begin to live it. That's not because you're not welcome. You are welcome. But I'm telling you, I do not want this to be a safe place for robbers. I do not want this to be a safe place for fornicators. I do not want this to be a safe place for pornographic addiction. I do not want this to be a safe place for inappropriate talk. For dirty lives. This is a place of salvation and for healing. And if it stops being a house of prayer, what is this house for? If this house is for any other reason than for you to meet God, I don't want any part in it. But Jesus says, if you'll make it a house of prayer, I'll meet you there. If you'll keep a house of prayer, a place of prayer, I'll meet you there. Verse 47, and he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the of people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Verse 1 of chapter 20, one day as Jesus was teaching the people at the temple and preaching, he was teaching and preaching, he was teaching and pre- There's a difference. Teaching is an explanation Preaching is proclamation. Preaching is what you do when you tell somebody, I follow Jesus. How about you? That's, that's preaching. But teaching is when someone comes to you and says, how can I be saved? And you lay out for them the way that, that, that you can live, how you can live a saved life, how you can live out, how you can understand the word of God. What does the scripture say? That's teaching, but preaching is proclamation. I follow Jesus. Preaching the gospel. He's given the good news. The chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things and who it is that gave you this authority. By what authority do you do these things? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Well, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Hey, can I, can I free you real quick? I know there's a part of you that wants to have a good answer for every question. But I want you to know, your master often did not think it was necessary for him to give an answer. The people who come at you with questions, you can sense their spirit. If they're coming to actually learn something or if they're trying to catch you in something. And let me just tell you, if they're trying to catch you in something, you don't have to take the bait. I know this is not helpful after Thanksgiving and Christmas. But maybe you could tuck it away for this next year, the political year, you know, presidential election year. Maybe you could tuck it away. When somebody comes to you ready to attack you or ready to twist your words and you know it, maybe you could just ask them a question back. 
Well, why, who are you voting for? I don't talk to people about that. Okay. Well, why would you vote for this person? Because I know who you're voting for. Why are you voting for your person? Hey, here's another thing. You can respond with a question without an accusation. Did you know that? You can ask somebody why they're voting the way they're going to vote without calling them something. If somebody were to explain to you that they're voting Democrat, right? I mean, hit the ground. If somebody were to do that, you do not have to call them an abortionist who likes to kill babies. You don't have to. Even the fact that it's true doesn't mean you have to say it. Did you know that? There are some things you can keep right up in here. It's amazing. If you need to say it, why don't you go to your diary and just write it all in there and, and use all the, the, the really colorful language you want to between you and God and talk about how horrible these other people are. Maybe it's real quiet in here because all of us are voting Democrat. Maybe, maybe I was wrong. Do, do, you know that you, do you know that people who vote the, the conservative way, but it doesn't mean they're greedy? Did you know that? You don't have to call somebody greedy that hates the poor. You don't have to. You can, but it ain't going to help you none. What if the next time somebody was trying to catch you in something, you didn't think it was your job to catch them in something? What if the next time somebody wanted a tug of war with you, you dropped the rope? Thanks. He's a Generation Z. He don't know what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you this year, there's going to be a lot of tests in this area of your life. And if you're going to make it through with friends, you might need to go ahead and tuck away that pride somewhere else. Because I can promise you, I can promise you, you might win the election, but you will not win this year. You're going to lose a lot more than you're going to win. Your guy, your girl might make it. I promise you. She ain't your savior and she ain't gonna, he is not going to fix anything. You're going to lose a lot more this year than you're going to gain. Anything's better than what... Hey, go ahead and get that out of your brain. I, if, you're, if you're thinking something in this world is going to save you, I hope I wake you up today. You can respond with a question. Jesus responded with a question. That's the first thing he did. The second thing he responded with was a parable. He says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 9, and he began to tell the people the parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it, let it out to tenants and went into another country for a while, a long while. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. Okay? The owner is coming for fruit. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. He wants fruit. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. The one, this one also was wounded and cast out. Then the, answer, uh, then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Now this word beloved means one and only, my begotten, the only one from me. I will send the only heir that I have. I will send my son. Perhaps they will respect him. You know, I look at this and I'm like, what is wrong with this owner? Why would he think that they would respect him? But you know, love will blind you. And I just want you to know that based on how we have treated his prophets throughout the years, it makes no sense that he would send his son to us. And yet he did it because he loves you. And what did we do? We murdered his son. But thankfully, we didn't have the power to keep him there. He, is, he lives again so that we can live also. Verse 14, but when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, I want you to understand, he tells this parable to the people, but the, the, the big dogs are hearing, they're listening. And they jump in. These scribes jump in at this point and they say, surely not. When they heard this, they said, surely not, which if you'll look at the word, it actually means the opposite of amen. You know, 
It's, it's don't, don't let it be. Uh, it's, it's the same word that Paul uses in the book of Romans when he says, uh, should we not sin more that grace should abound more? Of course not. That's the way he ends that. It's the same word Luke is using here, which means that they responded with uh, not, not amen, not okay. We, are not okay. we do not agree with this. And the crazy thing was Jesus was prophesying his own death that would take place five days later, and they were saying, no, we won't, and they were the very ones who killed him. Hey, let's take a thought right here. You may not know yourself as well as you think you do. You may not be nearly as selfish or as prideful or as arrogant or as angry. You may not have any of those things as much as you think you do. The best thing for you to do is not to state who you are, state who he is. Because all it takes is one good conversation to reveal your heart. We went through a difficult time at our last church in, in a season that is just, it breaks my heart to think about it. It was such a hard time. But I told my church, I told them in that moment, and I have said it over and over, that oper- uh, uh, circumstances do not create conflict. They reveal it. Circumstances do not create conflict. They reveal it. Can I just tell you, next year we're going to see another election where it's 50-50. Across every state, We're going to be voting one side liberal, one side conservative. And the thing that we should realize more and more is that we are becoming a more and more divided nation. We are not becoming more unified. We're not becoming more unified around science. We didn't become more unified around uh, fighting a virus. We did not become more unified around any any person. Two 80-year-old white dudes is the best thing we got now? Like, Really? I'm not mean to be political, y'all, but I just, I just really want to be clear. Like, this is all we got? Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone shall be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. I'm telling you today, You can build your house on anything. But if you're not building it on Jesus, it will fall flat. Anything else is sinking sand. And I I need to be very clear with you today. I, I want you to understand, I don't even mean the byproduct of Jesus. I don't even mean a side job of Jesus. Because, because, Look, I'm not going to spend every week this next year talking about politics, so I'm trying to shove it all into this sermon, and I won't talk about it anymore, I hope. But let me just be very clear with you. The last election, they shut down the church. No, it was the virus. It was Okay, uh, by the way, there was a Republican in, in, in the White House when it took place, so don't think you're safe by a party. Okay. Um, they put us in our homes for a few weeks. Well, I didn't have to. I still, you know, I'm essential and I went, okay, I hear you, but uh, don't, don't yell at me. Just listen. I believe it was a test drive. And as your pastor, I need to be very clear with you. Please don't let this church become your salvation. Because if they close the doors... If you need this room to maintain a relationship with Jesus, I'm begging you today, unplug and go to Jesus. If the only way you understand the word of God is if it's come secondhand by me, and I know I do a great job. (laughs) But I want you to know, as good as I am, I'm only secondhand. I, I can... At best, you are throwing what I'm saying in the microwave and trying to warm it up for yourself. I, I, I am not better than this word. I'm begging you. You say to yourself right now, oh, well, Webb, I don't understand it. I'm just going to throw my hands in the air. I'm begging you. Become more affiliated with this than TikTok or Facebook. Please, please begin to plug into this. Well, Webb, what am I supposed to do? I don't understand it. I'm, I'm begging you before... 
you're alone with this, begin to understand it while, while you still have some help. Now let me tell you, I'm not going anywhere. This church ain't going anywhere. Just because they shut these doors doesn't mean that we're not going to still be here for you. But it might have to meet in your house. We need to be believers who are ready to invite Christians into our house to talk about the Word of God instead of holding the Word of God as the only time we talk about it is on Sunday morning when we pay a professional to tell us what it means. This was written so that you could understand it in your own home. Well, Webb, I don't understand it. Should I get a commentary? No, because I can tell you how I disagree with every commentary out there. Oh, so you don't want me to listen to the scholars. I don't. Guess who I want you to listen to? Not Webb. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can reveal this to you anyway. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, and it costs nothing. Now, this will cost you something. Get you a good Bible, that will cost you some money. That make a lot of money off Bibles. Invest in it because this is, here's another thing I want you to think about. Technology, I don't know if you recognize it this year, but AI came on the scene, and there was like two weeks of like, oh, watch out, AI, and then all of a sudden every industry, including preachers, were like, I use AI every day. I get an email every single day from a company that's trying to sell me an AI program that will write my sermons for me. Every day I get this email. Did you hear what I just said? Now, by, by the way, I don't, I don't use it. I have a computer telling me he'd like to write my sermons for me. That didn't freak y'all out at all. Okay, that's cool. That's good. I just want all of you in this room to know, and again, fear-mongering, I don't need any, we don't, I'm not trying to scare you all, my direction. I'm just trying to tell you that if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, that you're not relying on the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures, if you're not daily in the word of God and praying to God, if you're not having relationships outside of this room on a Sunday morning that are benefiting your spiritual life, I'm begging you, begging you, begging you. The biggest thing you need to put on your 2024 list are those four things. That I'm going to be a Christian outside of this room. This is not a thing that you get an hour and a half and you get all you need. This hour and a half is to give you a shot so that you can go and be the Christian you're supposed to be all the other hours a week. Okay? So, I, and I, I just, I, I'm, I'm very concerned. And if, if you're not concerned yet, let me just throw out some other words. Russia, China, Iran, Israel. Throw that in there. Election year. Hey, here's something. You live in a rural area. It's one of the reasons Amanda and I wanted to move back to rural. We're so glad to be here. This is what I want you to do. This year, I want you to plant an extra row. I want you to throw some water at me. I want you to plant an extra row. And then I want you to can it. I want you to freeze it. I want you to keep it. Not so that you can hoard it when things hit the fan, but so you can share it. I want, I want you to fill up freezers. And if Walmart goes cheap again on them, I want you to buy some more freezers. I want you to fill them up, but I don't want you to throw any of it away. I don't want you to waste any food, but I want you to have it. I want all the things that the cities think that they have better because of their convenience. When the, when the doors begin to shut, I want them to understand the beauty of living in a small town where people actually see each other, care about one another, and have the means to take care of themselves. Amen. Now, wouldn't it be a shame if we were so dependent on Amazon, even us out here in rural didn't even know how to live if Amazon got shut down. Wouldn't that be a shame? Wouldn't it be a shame if, if, if every person in their 30s starved completely to death because food Burger King wasn't open? Learn how to make a microwave meal every once in a while, y'all. Hey, learn how to make a fire. You might need it. Learn how to study the Word of God for yourself. Put some money and some food aside. Not, again, not to hoard, but to share. Pray hard about who to vote for this year. Don't get distracted by such things. Listen, please don't get distracted by the political things, because that is what it's designed for. 
I, some people sometimes think I say stay off of news. I'm not telling you to stay off of news. I'm saying stay off of news if you can't handle it. If you can't keep yourself, if you can't control yourself because of the fear that you hold, get off of it. Unplug. This is a drug that will kill you. I got to tell you, some of the illicit drugs out there, I'm not nearly as afraid of those addicts as the people that are on news. You see them tapping their arms every time. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear what's happening today? Did you hear what's going on? Oh, my. Chill. I, it's freaking you out today, but it'll be gone tomorrow. One way or another. They're going to take America. And when they take America, then we'll be like, oh, we'll speak in Chinese, of course. But we'll have the same conversations again. That's not funny. I know it's not funny. But the truth is, if your foundation is based in this nation, you, 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 gotta, you need to wake up. I'm closing. Jesus weeps, which shows his humanity, his desire to bring peace to the city of peace that would be destroyed. Jesus cleanses, which shows his authority. He cleanses the temple. He pushes those people off of the temple mount, which shows off his authority. After he does that authority, then they ask him, by what authority do you do this? And Jesus challenges them with a question, with a, pro, uh, with a parable, and then with a prophecy. That's how his response was. With a question, with a parable, and with a prophecy. He challenges them back, which shows his vulnerability. Jesus, God is not some great thing so far away. He's willing to have a conversation with you. If you have questions, take them to Jesus he may not answer them he may ask you more questions but you should take it and he's willing to listen he's willing to listen to you if you will go to prayer to the house of prayer he will listen to your thoughts and he will respond lastly he teaches he teaches that he's the son of the owner which means that he is deity his humanity his authority his vulnerability and his deity were all on display in this area and what I want for you to understand today now, by the way, when, when he responds to those people, what they were trying to do was catch him in his words. If he said that, he, that John the Baptist, if they said that John the, uh, um, I'm sorry, that if Jesus, if Jesus would have said that I had no authority, he was in trouble with the Jews for invading the temple. But if he said he had authority that come from God, that he was in control, then he was in trouble with the Romans. They were trying to catch him in his words. In fact, we're going to have three of those. This, the next three weeks will be a challenge of different sorts. One challenge was this one where they asked him about what authority. The next one will be about taxes, and the last one will be about the afterlife. They're trying to catch him in his words, and Jesus is smarter than they are. The servants were the prophets. I believe it was the idea of the promise through Abraham, the covenant through Moses, and the prophets that followed behind Elijah. And God sent all three of those, and we did not understand, so he sent his son. Jesus tells of his own death, which would be fulfilled in that week. I want you to understand what the word lust means, because I believe that's what they're struggling with right now. They can't believe that they would kill the son of God. The word lust doesn't mean what we usually think it is. We, we usually have a very sexual connotation, but the word lust is actually not, not specifically about that area. It, it's specifically a spiritual word that means that you desire something so much that if you could get away with it, you would do anything to get it. Okay, that's what lust means. You desire something so much that if you could get away with it, you would do anything to get it. Okay, so if you could steal somebody else's truck and get away with it, you would do it because you lust, you desire it so much. If you could have somebody else's spouse, don't look at anybody, and get away with it, you would do it. A lot of times, a lot of times, a lot of us are struggling with lust. We, the only thing that keeps us safe is the law. If that ever got removed, can you imagine the lawlessness that we would see? There are people right now that don't mind to shoot people in cold blood knowing that the law is right down the road. Can you imagine what will happen when they're hitting the law down the road? Do you understand that the only thing holding back evil sometimes right now are the first responders we have? And if that begins to move away out of the spot, can you imagine the, the chaos that will ensue? These guys, they were saying, "How dare we would never kill the Son of God, and yet they did it later on that week. Because, the reason they killed him was because they were afraid that he was going to ruin the temple. But guess what ruined the temple? The very people they were afraid of. The Romans were the ones who came to destroy the temple, not Jesus. 
they kill Jesus in hopes to save the temple, and it, and just you know, a few years later, their precious temple that they were willing to kill the Son of God over was also decimated by the very people they're trying to be saved from. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Lust has a way of warping your understanding that if I can get away with it, I deserve it. I hate the word deserve. I hate it when people say, like, I hope 2024 is the year you deserve. Oh, God, please don't. I don't want any of that. I don't want anything I deserve. Jesus wants to bring you peace. What does the word peace mean? Completeness, wholeness. He wants to bring togetherness and and unity. He wants that for you. Okay, if you've fallen asleep, I want you to wake up because this is my end. He wants you to have peace. He comes to bring you peace. He's the prince of peace. He wants you to have peace. Today, I want you to pray for peace, for completeness in your life. I want you to understand that if there are things that are ruining your spiritual peace, you need to get rid of those things. You need to get rid of those things. If there's things that are causing you friction in your relationships, that the relationships that you have to keep. Now, there may be some relationships that you need to get rid of in order to keep the relationships that matter most. You hear what I'm saying? Some of you might need to start looking at a new job. Some of you in this room might need to start looking at that. Some of you may be needing to look at a new avenue of the, of the way you're living because you have lost the peace of your life and you keep saying to yourself, I just have to coast it out for 40 more years and I'll finally get peace. I'm just, not thus saith the Lord, I'm just telling you, if Jesus wants you to have peace, then you ought to want peace. And if there are things you're allowing in your life to steal that from you, you need to, the way Jesus did with the temple, you need to push out all those other things out of the way. You need to pull all the other things off the temple mount so that you can keep it a house of prayer. God wants to meet you in prayer. He wants to meet you. And so guess what you need to do? You need to have a place of prayer. You need to have a house of prayer. Hopefully your house is a place of prayer. But you need a a regular time where you go to meet with the Lord. My encouragement is to leave iPhone plugged up somewhere else. Go meet just a few moments with the Lord. And here's the beautiful thing. When you go into the presence of God, when you go into the throne room, whether you're kneeling or not, the moment is just you and God. If you could open your spiritual eyes and see Jesus sitting up on the throne and the elders all around him and the angels all around you and all the creatures of the world standing beside you looking up and praising God the angels the seraphim around his throne saying holy 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 is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come and and you could get the viewpoint of Revelation chapter 5 or Isaiah chapter 6 or the different times that we hear about the throne room of God or the way it's it's told in the New Testament that we can go into the throne room with, with boldness because we are his children and we can go right in there if you could take a moment and every single day go to the throne room for a few moments and say to him Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. You join with the angels. Your kingdom come and your will be done all the way down in earth as it's already done in heaven. And if you could take a moment every day and get the perspective of the throne room of heaven And then when you open your eyes back in your prayer room and you stand up and you go out and fulfill the very thing that you saw had already done, it was done in heaven. There's some problems in your life that are already done in heaven. They're already figured out. You're worried about stuff that's already finished. You just got to wait to see it with these eyes. If you took time every day to go into your prayer room and realize that, that God's not up there pacing he, he's, not, he's, not, he's not flipping through the news channels and being like, oh, this again. He sits on his throne, the Christ at his right hand. Jesus drives out the intruders of the house of prayer. 2024 will be the loudest year you have ever experienced. I'm not a prophet or the child of a prophet. I'm just telling you, this is going to be the loudest year ever. You need to find a way to remove the distractions. So you can have a house of prayer. And if you will do that, if you will stay focused on the things that really matter, 
then he'll give you power. And somebody will come to you this year. I promise you. If you will regularly go into the prayer, there'll be a time where some of us in this room, somebody will come and say, by what authority do you live? How in the world do you keep peace when everybody else has gone crazy? How have you stayed with your spouse when it's been so easy for everybody else to leave theirs? How do your children still have faith, hope, and love? How have you made, I know your boss. Mercy. How, right Randy? Um, How, how do you stay committed? How do you keep on, and you can say, you can either answer with a question, you can do that, or you can say, there's a place I go every day where all that stuff goes away. There's a place I go every day where all that stuff goes away. And if you'll create a place of prayer, Jesus promises to meet you there. Those things rhyme. You know they're, they're anointed. <laughs> There's a place I go every day where all that stuff goes away. And if you'll create a place of prayer, Jesus will meet you there. That's not even in my notes. He's so generous with this gospel and empowers you to share it. Build your house on the rock because everything else is going to fall away. They killed Jesus in hopes to protect their temple and it was gone. They, they tried to keep Jesus shut up so that the Romans would hear. Guess what? Rome is gone. Everything that we do in this world to protect ourselves other than build our house on Jesus Christ. It's going to fade away. So as we end 2023 in this service, let's just take a minute. We're going to turn the song on. I'm just going to play a song. I just want us to take a minute and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for making it another year, helping me get through this year. Thank you for helping me make it. And then, Lord, I ask you for these three things. I pray for peace. I pray you meet me when I pray. And I pray you give me power to preach the gospel. Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.